and he had his Eagle jersey on and the name Jackson, the 10 jersey. But guess what he had in his hand? He had that terrible towel. So <laughs> <laughs> it, it was something about him, man. He loved the Steelers. Hey, everybody. What's up? Trey Wingo here. Welcome into another episode of Half Forgotten History. Got a great guest for you this week. We've had so many big names this season, but he was a big play waiting to happen every time he took the field. I'm talking about, of course, the dynamic wide receiver, Deshaun Jackson. Whether it was his volatile early days in Philadelphia and some of the other places he stopped along the way, whenever you had Deshaun Jackson on your team, you knew you could have a 50-yard touchdown pass at any time, at any point in any game. So what to make of his career, and is he really done? Sit back and enjoy this conversation with Deshaun Jackson. All right, Deshaun, let's start here. Like, are you done done? Or are you still thinking that uh, a team might be calling sometime soon? That's the, uh, that's the greatest question of the world right now, man. Uh, <laughs> way to start the interview off. Uh, man, uh, mentally and physically, man, uh, you know, I, I pour so much into the to the game of football, you know, since I've been a little kid. Um, a dream come true, making it from, you know, Los Angeles, California, a, a kid that had all the odds against him. And, uh, you know, yeah. I, I, I made it. I proved to everybody that, you know, I can play at a high level. And, you know, with all the naysayers and the doubters, um, my whole life is saying I wasn't going to make it. I proved everybody wrong. So as far as I'm not done, I'm not quite done. I still have, uh, you know, more fuel in the tank. But uh, you know, it just got to be a right situation. You know, I, I'm definitely at a at a point in my life where, you know, I'm, I'm content. But I'm, I'm, I'm not quite done. You know what I'm saying? I still got some yeah. fire left in me, man. <laughs> that answers the question. Yeah, have have teams uh, sort of called and said, hey, you know, st- we might have some issues that we need to address later, so stay in shape. Have you had those kind of conversations? Yeah, man, it's been interesting. Uh, been having a, a a lot of interaction. You know, my agent, Drew Rosenhaus, obviously uh, been been talking to oh, a yeah. lot of teams. You know, I, I got some, some real good relationships with a few coaches, GMs and stuff. Uh, you know, it's just kind of been a little bit back and forth talk. Uh you know, I don't. I don't really want to spill the beans on on the teams, but it's been some playoff contender teams. You know, with with uh, a lot of hope. You know, towards the end of the season. But you know, whenever that time is, you know, I'm definitely staying working, staying working out, uh, staying on my grind and doing what I need to do. Uh, I think regardless if I play or I don't play, I'm always gonna work out. You know, because that's 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 good health right. and that's something I've been accustomed to my whole life. So it's just something about going out on the field and catching the ball and running routes that just puts me at a different uh, you know place. Deshaun, you're you're from L.A. You're from South Central, which obviously has a lot of connotations that go to it. And there's a lot of people that are looking for ways to get out of that situation. You were a Little League teammates with Richard Sherman back in the day. He posted that picture years ago, of the two of you together on that baseball team. What was it like growing up in that situation and trying to use uh, athletics to get out of a, a bad situation? Uh, for me, I mean, it was just... It it was the edge, man. It kind of just you know, it, it rubbed me from a young kid just growing up in the in the areas to see the the odds. You know, people not really having the opportunities, people not having um you you know fathers, mothers in their lives, uncles, you know, older brothers to look up to. Uh, it was really no hope. It was no direction. And uh, I was very fortunate. I had a father that was actually from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Him and my mom moved to California. And uh, they just wanted to leave Pittsburgh. It was cold. And they was like, man, we're just going to leave Pittsburgh. And they came to California. I don't know, obviously because of the weather of California, but they just happened to come to California. And here comes little Deshaun that I was born here. So, you know, just growing up, man, just really having that, that eager, that, 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 that swagger, that edge, you know, that, that roughness. It was like, man, you know, there's, there's nothing is possible. And, you know, I kind of had to almost look at the impossible because it was like you was up behind the eight ball. So for me, everything I wanted to do, you know, I didn't really have the resources. We didn't have the funding. Everything was like get it out the mud. You know, it's like at the ground level and just make the most out of it. So with saying that, it was, you know, every obstacle of the way people doubted me. People saying I was too small. I wasn't big enough to play in the NFL. So it was like all this built up. You know, animosity, anger is just used it to prove people wrong. And, and having a support team, I think, was the biggest thing. My dad, you know, implementing my older brothers and, you know, a group of men around me that kind of just mentored me the whole way through it. Yeah, I remember seeing the documentary about your dad and your brother. Uh, and it really was a remarkable journey uh, that right. he put you guys on. And, and he, he put you guys out there early to make sure know that you had direction in your lives. And he, 
you know, there are a lot of fathers that wish things for their sons, right? But what I sure. remember about watching that with your dad is he didn't wish it. He had a plan for it, and he made sure you guys were executing the plan. Yeah, I mean, as a young kid, you don't really understand the importance of being a, a you know, a son and, and really listening to what your dad you know, had out for you, you know, the obstacles you had to face, uh, you know, him, him really making a plan and you being a young kid and not really understanding the plan is the biggest thing for me. Like I didn't really start understanding it until I got older when I was like, Oh, I'm in high school now. Like, dang, now I'm starting to understand why my dad was so hard on me, why he was so strict on me, why he didn't want me hanging out in the streets, why he didn't me, why he didn't want me hanging out with certain individuals. So as a kid, you just want to have fun. You want to go outside. You want to do knucklehead stuff. You know, I was a knucklehead. Right. I grew up. I was a bad kid. You Same. know, don't. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So we got we got some similarities, but I think it just out of nowhere kind of just start clicking off, clicking on. Uh, I think like high school. You know, I started getting the notoriety. I started getting the, the scholarships. And I was like, man, I could really be good in football. So, like, let me start taking this serious. And, uh, you know, my dad being so strict and hard on me, you know, I was, we was, my sister's birthday was just, and I was, we was talking about, like, how I was one of the baddest kids out of all my dad's sons. And it was like, I used to get butt whoopings. I used to get the belt. Like, you know, nowadays it would have probably been crazy. Child services would have been coming to get my dad. But back then, you know, you can, you can, you can kind of, I'm not, I'm not promoting it, but you know, I, I was right. pretty bad. So I had yeah, to get that belt. I had to get that belt on me sometime. <laughs> yeah. Well, but, but you're right. And, and you mentioned going to high school. You didn't go to any high school. You went to Long right. Beach Poly. And, and mm -hmm. I think a lot of people listening to this podcast or watching it probably understand what that is. But for those that don't, here, here's the best way I can describe Long Beach Poly. No high school in the history of the United States has produced more NFL players than Long Beach Poly. We're talking yourself. We're talking Winston Justice. We're talking Willie McGinnis, Juju Smith-Schuster, you know, Omar Stoutmeyer, Marquez Pope. I mean, the list goes on and on and on and on. So sure. when you thought about playing for Long Beach Poly, what did that mean to you when you were there? And what does it mean to you now that you've sort of gone through it and maybe understood the history more? Well... Growing up in Los Angeles, um, you know, I, I didn't grow up in the Long Beach area. Like, everybody always thinks that I'm, you know, from Long Beach and, right. you know, I was raised in Long Beach. But kind of growing up in the L.A. area, I mean, it was either Crenshaw, Westchester, Dorsey, Venice, um, you know, and a few other teams, you know, that was kind of good when I was kind of growing up. So I can remember uh, my older brother, Derek, he was like, man, Coach Don Norford. Does the name sound familiar? Don Norford? He's a legendary yeah. coach for Long Beach Poly, like a, a old school track football coach. But he was like one of the best high school coaches ever. And he was like, man, Don Norford is over there, man. He's like, you go out there, you could train with Don Norford, you could run track. You know, they'll groom you into playing football. And it was like, man, something about Poly was like, man, they got Herschel Dennis, Mercedes Lewis, uh, Manuel Mercedes Wright. Lewis, yeah. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Like the, the list. Got, like when I was a freshman, when I came in, we had like five All-American you know, uh, D1 scholars, and it was like going Jarell into Casey. some. Yeah, Jarrell Casey. I mean, it goes, it goes. Mark Russell, Kenyon Rambo. It goes forever. Mark, Mark Carrier. <laughs> like, you know, it's a lot yeah. of names. So for me, just going in and, and being a part of that, it was just bigger than any other high school could offer. And for me, like, I always thought big. I always dreamed big. Like, I'm like, I knew I was good, but I'm like, to be great, I had to go play with the greats. You know what I'm saying? And from an early yeah. age, I went to compete. When I went into poly as a ninth grader, it was crazy. Like, all the, the, the competing, all the players that was there, like, I ain't had no choice. So I went in there, and I earned my respect as a young kid. I earned it. I went in there, and I competed. And we just built something different at poly, man. But just from a kid that's outside of the Long Beach area to come there and be almost like they took me in as one of their own, I mean, it was, it was it was a dream come true, and, you know, that, that kind of writes the history, man. From there, everything else was set, man. The, the bar was set at ninth grade, and it was set, and I yeah. earned it, and I worked hard for it. And a lot of people don't really realize and understand what I had to go through, man. Oh, absolutely. And, and then uh, that plays out well, and, and you go on to, to Cal, where you actually had an amazing career. Uh, what did you learn playing at Cal that sort of helped you build on what happened at Long Beach Poly? Well, I think going into Cal, uh, man, from having all the top scholar uh, scholarships from SC, Florida State, Oklahoma, I mean, LSU, Alabama wasn't really too nothing crazy like they are now. But, I mean, all, right. all, the, all the schools I had scholarships from, it was like 
for me to kind of like turn my back because I actually did a soft commit to USC. That was right when they won the national championship. They had Lindell White, Reggie Bush, Matt Leinart, sure. all them. They was I remember they was on a bus and they won a national championship. And Pete Carroll called me. He was like, "So what you gonna do?" I'm like, "Man, I'm coming. I'm, I'm committing. <laughs> Y'all just won the national championship. I'm coming." But to turn down, you know, scholarships from schools like that and to go to Cal, it was like I seen Cal. They was they was turning around something different there. They had um, um, Aaron Rodgers, Marshawn Lynch, right. you know, and I'm like, that was the year they. I think a year or two before that, they beat SC at the Coliseum. I think I was a sophomore in, in high school. And I was like, man, Cal's building something special. Jeff Tepper was there. They was building something special. And I'm like, you know what? I can go to Cal and I can make my own mark. Like, if I would have went to SC, I would have had to fall in under the Reggie Bushes and the Matt Liner and all these other guys. I'm like, Cal, it was great enough for me to go there. You know, like I said, they had Marshawn and they had Aaron Rodgers. But besides that... I mean, you don't really think of too many players like that. So it it, it, it created me to go to, to create my own mark. But going back to Long Beach Poly, it kind of already had me ready for that. Because when I came in, I was used to competing at a high level already. So as a freshman, I came in and I started as a freshman at Cal. So it was like I was always ahead of the eight ball because I always competed. Growing up, I always played with people that were older than me. So if I'm... Right. 13 i'm playing with the 15 year olds you know what i'm saying so every step of the way i'm all, i'm already kind of like developed already so by the time i got to, to cal and then vice versa by the time i got to to the philadelphia eagles i'm starting as a rookie so it's like every time i'm always advanced like i always and that, that's the credit for my dad and my older brothers because i was always playing with older people i remember t- hearing a lot about you going into the 2008 draft and, and, mm-hmm. and seeing what was going to happen there um, and there were a lot of people, well, well, actually one of the things I really remember is you worked out with Jerry Rice before the draft. The two of you worked out. What did it mean for you that the guy that still many people consider the greatest football player of all time said, I want to work out with this kid? Well, I, I was lucky. I actually was signed to an agent by the DeBartlos and, uh, Jerry Rice was actually, the DeBartlos used to own the 49ers. So the DeBartlos uh represented Jerry Rice around this time and I actually signed to them coming out of out of college um to the DeBartlos and uh it was just a great relationship that the agent I was with you know represented him and you know he 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 actually seen a lot because I was in Cal and he was in the Bay Area you know because Jerry Rice lives up there and uh he seen me right. play a few times at Cal and he, he just took liking to me. He's like, man, there's something about that young dude, man. I like his eager. I like his fire. I mean, he he's a beast. And, uh, you know, I was fortunate enough to get a workout with him before the uh, before the draft. And I, I ran every route. He said, man, I just want to see your routes. I don't want to critique you. I don't want to do nothing. He said, I want, I want you to run every route for me. I ran every route. And when I tell you, he said, I don't even want to correct you on one route. I said, I said, yeah. I said, what route is that? He said, the speed out. So the speed out is a five-yard quick step out. He said, you're running too fast. Stop running so fast. He said, slow down. If you're running under tempo and you get in and out of your break and you smooth, he said, you're going to kill the NFL. And I sat back. I said, the best receiver in the NFL history of the, of the game is telling me one route. You only want to correct me on one route. And I just knew. Like, after that, I'm like, it's over. <laughs> like, you telling me that I'm, I got it already. And it was just like that built my confidence up. So, by the time I got to the NFL and that first year of my rookie, my rookie year, I was like, man, I, I I knew I had it. You get what I'm saying? And the game yeah. wasn't too big for me. I had, I had the mentality. I'm coming in. I don't care who you are. I'm taking your spot. And whoever's guarding me, you ain't going to be able to stop me. That's just the mentality I instilled in myself. Were you surprised then you lasted until the second round? I mean, honestly, uh, I, I think me being drafted in the second round has made it a lot better for a lot of young, not even young receivers, a lot of receivers under six feet. And this is my philosophy right. on that. Before I was, before I entered the NFL, I mean, you had the Marvin Harrisons, the Torrey Holtz, you had the Steve Smiths. But if you really look at it, the, the, the type of receiver I am, you really didn't you you really didn't see that before I came into the NFL. So now you got the Tavon Austins, you got uh, uh the the Hollywood Browns, you got the Tyreek Hills. Yeah. Like a lot of these receivers now, NFL scouts and NFL GMs and teams, they're not gonna miss that because once I came in, they like, man, we can't miss out on certain dudes like that because these dudes can play. I mean, the NFL is a big man sport. Everybody's always six three, muscular, tough, physical, but it's like. I feel like back then they they slipped and they missed certain certain players. It was under the five, I mean six feet. So I think I already implemented, 
I really implemented them saying like, man, we can't we can't look past these 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 type of receivers no more. So for me, I feel like slipping was more because my weight. I was 169. I was five nine and however many quarters, and it, it just was at that time they didn't really know. You know what I'm saying? So it's like yeah. now they're going to take chances on them because, you know, guys like myself, guys like, you know, the Tyreek Hills. And, the, you know, even though Tyreek is a little more physical and he's like a running back playing receiver. But, you know, I really think I, I, Devontae I changed. Devontae Smith, same way. Devontae yeah. Smith, the same way. Exactly. So, I like I said, man, I, I think, you know, it, it definitely had GMs and, you know, guys like yourself. I mean, you you know talent. I mean, you know. So yeah. seeing it now, it's like, man, we can't miss that. So I think I, I definitely helped imp- implement that in the NFL. So you get drafted in the NFL in the second round and things are, and we'll get into your rookie season in a minute, but at at the same time, you're reaching the pinnacle or the place that so many people, as you said, doubted you, didn't think you would get there. The man who helped architect that for you, your father, Bill, Mm -hmm. becomes sick with pancreatic Mm -hmm. cancer. Mm -hmm. So how did you deal with the sort of the, the duality of it, for lack of a better term, of you finally achieving all the success that you and your dad had dreamed of? And then seeing your dad dealing with something that is really, really difficult. Yeah, I, I think for me, man, it, it, it was it was life setting and set. You know, it was it was more of a reality and seeing my, my stone. It was like my rock. You know, it was like my backbone. You know, everything that I was, everything that was poured into me, everything, you know, the early morning, the workouts, him traveling all across the world, taking me to football practices, track practices, basketball, baseball, like, you know, it was just more of like that, that, that father figure that you dream to have, you know what I'm saying, even though he was hard on me, even though sometimes I hated him, like I said, the older I got, I understood it, and it was all for a better reason, but, you know, for me, it was kind of, I was lost, you know, I, I went years, you know, in the NFL and lost, but I would say in 2010 after, you know, because he passed in 09, my second season, yeah. You know, it was like something that sparked. It was like a different fire I had. And it was like, man, I lost my pops. It was like, now I really felt to take on everything that he always tell, told everybody. My son's going to be one of the best receivers in the NFL. My son's going to kill the NFL. My son is going to be something the NFL have never seen. You know, so for me, it was like I had to go prove that. I lost my pops. Yeah. He got sick, pancreatic cancer. Now... I got to go be everything and more than my dad always told everybody because everybody thought my dad was crazy. They didn't believe him. They said, oh, yo, you crazy. Your son ain't going to be half of what you said. You know what I'm saying? So for me, it was like just kind of that fire that was built up that I knew I had to go prove my pops right. You get what I'm saying? And that still to this day, man, every step of the way, you know, anything I do in life, being a father to my kids, being a a brother, being a friend, you know, I I just know how my dad was and everything he did, he did was enthusiastic. It was a a swagger with it. It was like, if you think I'm not going to do something, I'm still prove you right. You, I mean, still prove you wrong. You know what I'm saying? So it's just something I built in within me from, from my dad over the years. Was he okay with you going to the Eagles as a huge Steelers fan? Honestly, that's a, that's, that's a good question. See, my dad, he had an eagle. <laughs> Look, my so my first game, uh, it was yeah. we was actually in preseason. We actually played the Pittsburgh Steelers in Pittsburgh. So he was walking across the uh the, the bridge. What's the what's the name of the bridge? Who? The si- the the Sixth Street Bridge. Six, so the bridge. Sixth Street Bridge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so the bridge right there, right? So uh, he was walking across the bridge before the game and he had his eagle jersey on and the name jackson the 10 jersey but guess what he had in his hand he had that terrible towel so (laughs) it was something about him man he loved the Steelers, but i mean it it was he was just happy man he he was able to see you know even though he lost i mean we lost him in my after my first year i mean he he was able to see his dream come true man he wanted he wanted to see his son in the nfl he wanted to push his son he wanted to see his son make it and he was able to see his dream come true, man. So it was bittersweet, but uh, you know, I, I was an eagle. He he supported us, but you know, he had his towel on him. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely, listen. A, a father's love takes a it takes precedent over almost anything, and, and I sure. certainly could understand that. And it's very cool that look, my father-in-law. I lost my father-in-law to pancreatic cancer, so I know how brutal it can be and how quickly you can take somebody. Definitely. So it, I I just I think it's awesome for you and for him that you both got to see that happen for you before he passed. Definitely, man. I appreciate it, man. I'm sorry to hear about your loss as well, man. 
Yeah, it was a long time ago, but it, you know, you never you never forget it. You never forget. Never. It. So why don't we why don't we take our first break here and have forgotten history with the Sean Jackson? When we come back, we'll talk about that rookie year and your explosion onto the scene and the things that you did in the NFL. Stay with us. We're coming right back. All right, time for our Mercedes-Benz trivia question. Now, Deshaun Jackson is 36th all-time in receiving yards in NFL history, but we want to know how many of those receivers ahead of him were, like him, under six feet tall. We'll give you the answer in the next break. You know, you open up a Mercedes-Benz Sprinter and you're opening more than doors. You're unlocking potential to do your own thing, be your own boss, and live out your own dreams. With 16 body types, your choice of a gas or diesel engine, and thousands of ways to customize, a Sprinter van is capable and versatile enough to help you drive your ambitions as far as you want to take them. So go ahead, unlock your potential inside a Mercedes-Benz Sprinter. All right, back with Deshaun Jackson on this episode of Half Forgotten History. So you're in the NFL now, you get drafted. What were your expectations going into that rookie season? Expectations for me, uh, you know, dream come true, man. Uh, a young kid from Los Angeles, Southern, Southern California, man. Um, you know, once again, all the naysayers, all the doubters, and finally being able to say, hey, I made it to the NFL second round draft. But even though I was kind of bitter because I felt I was a first round talent. And, uh, sure. you know, it's things that happen, you know, towards the end of my junior season that, you know, I, we, we don't have to necessarily get into. But I think that kind of, um, you know, messed with my draft status a little bit. But uh, coming coming in right away to a team like Philadelphia where you had Donovan McNabb, Brian Westbrook, Brian Dawkins, uh, Jaquay Parker. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. You know, for me, it was like falling into a team where they had a lot of respectable and a lot of, you know, players that was, you know, proven. You know, for me to be able to come into a team to guys that know the right way. Like, Brian Dawkins, he told me from day one. Like I love your game, but you got to get on your shit. You get what I'm saying? Like he wasn't, yeah. and he don't, he didn't even curse too much. But he was one of them. No. When he was on the field, he turned into something else. He, you know, Weapon X. <laughs> oh, I remember. I, yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> we was in training camp, and I caught like a little five yard hitch, and we on the same team. He came and tried to kill me. I got up. I'm like, we on the same <laughs> team. Like I let me make it to the season. He was like, that's just how yeah. I play, young fella. But I mean, I came in right away and knew how to be a pro. You know what I'm saying? I think as a yeah. as a young kid, being able to come from college and into the NFL, knowing how to do it the right way, knowing how to take care of your body, knowing how to put in the extra work, knowing how to stay in your books as far as the classroom. When I say the books, your playbook, knowing the ins and outs of certain languages and lingo. You know, so for me coming into a team like that and Andy Reid all time. Hands down, one of my favorite coaches ever, man. It's like a father figure to me. Um, got so much respect for that guy. But, uh, you know, I, I, I came in, man, from from the get-go right away starting, man. I came in, and at the time it was uh, Reggie Brown and Kevin Curtis and J Jason right. Avant and Hank Baskett was the receivers. But, you know, I came in and started right away, man. And just so people understand the significance of that, you're the first rookie ever to start for – uh, uh, Andy Reid at wide receiver. He, that had never happened before. So I didn't so know that. Thanks for that stat. A... Thanks for that stat. Hey, listen, I didn't know that. <laughs> listen, you have you got my back. I got yours. Okay, that's the way this works. That's for the sure. way this works. So so you had a really good debut. Uh, I think you had six catches for 100 plus yards, and that went over the Rams. But of mm -hmm. course, the thing that most people remember about your rookie year would be the <laughs> Monday night game yeah. against the Dallas Cowboys. So. For those that don't remember, might have been a slight premature celebration. And, uh, you know, you celebrated before you got over the goal line. So what was going through your head after you realized, eh, I didn't quite get where I needed to go? Bonehead, man. That, that, that was one of the mistakes. <laughs> that was one of my most crucial mistakes. I think I, I've done that another time in my career, too, when I was in the uh, All-American game in high school. Yeah. I tried to uh, out-jump Reggie Bush. I remember he was – playing at SC and he did like a cartwheel flip or a somersault into the end zone from like the four or five yard line. So I'm like, I'm going to try to do it from the six. So I get up and jump and I'm like, Oh shit, it looks like it's about to hurt. <laughs> and I just let, I just, I just let the ball go. But, uh, fast forward back to the one in Philadelphia, uh, Monday night when we was playing versus the Cowboys, you know, Growing up, I always, like, just, it was something about celebrating. Like, you know, you wasn't able to celebrate in high school or college. So, it was like, this is my first time scoring a touchdown, national television. Like, all I was worried about was just dancing and, like, celebrating. So, you know, I, I jumped the gun a little bit before I got in the end zone, dropped the ball. But, uh, you know, I could just remember, like, 
you know, all the guys on the team was like, man, what are you doing? Like, you tripping. Like, man, take the ball through the end zone. I was like, yeah, I know it never happened again. But, I mean, that's just that's just life, man. Things happen. It's, it's, it's not about what happens. It's about how do you bounce back from what happens. And I think, yeah. you know, going on in my career, man, I, you know, had a hell of a career. And, you know, just not – repeating that again once once you do something all the young kids anybody that want to be anything in a professional if you do a bonehead thing once don't repeat it <laughs> that's how you stay yeah. in the nfl a long time so i was able to learn from that at an early age but uh yeah man i mean it's it's life man things things happen sometimes and you know it's just how you respond to them well luckily they got the touchdown i think on the very next play so it didn't really matter <laughs> and you got your first touchdown i think the very next week so if that's the if, if that was sort of the first in introduction to deshaun jackson as a pro i think the other game that so many people or the play that so many people remember is going to be the game against the giants when you guys were down i think it was in 2010 you guys were down crazy 31 to 10 with about 8 minutes to play you yep. score three touchdowns to tie the game up and Tom Coughlin death stared that punter uh, after he kicked the ball to you at the mm-hmm. metal ends. You drop it, but you pick it up and you take it back to the house for the game winning score. And I think it still remains the only punt returns for a score as time expired in the history of the NFL. For sure. Yeah, I think with, with that specific game, I can't go nowhere. If I find if I walk into somebody that's a New Yorker or a yeah. New York fan, a Giants fan, they like can't stand my guts. It's like, and I, I don't I don't went up around so many people, that's and it's a like, sign of respect. Actually, if you think about it, it's a sign of ultimate respect. But they're seriously like so mad at me. Now you know I, this is what I tell them every yeah. time. I say all I was doing was my job. How are you mad at me for doing my job? Yeah. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? But they're yeah. like, no, I'm a diehard Giants fan. You broke my heart. You killed me. I'm like, at the end of the day, it just I see. I'm not going to lie to you. I didn't think that punter was going to kick it in the stands. I mean, in the stadium. He, yeah, he, I thought he was going like, to punt it. He wasn't supposed to kick it to you. I thought yeah. he was going to punt it he outside the stadium. To. Yeah. <laughs> I thought he was going to punt it outside the stadium. So, as you see, when it, when I like, when like he punted it, I was in shock. I'm like, oh, my God, he really kicked it to me. Because you could tell like he tried to shank it. But, you know, sometimes yeah. when you shank it, you actually kick it inbound. So, once he kicked it to me. As you see, I blacked out. I fumbled on purpose. I tell everybody I fumbled on purpose. <laughs> so I fumbled on purpose. <laughs> but was crazy. Was crazy when I fumbled the ball. It actually bounced like three yards to the right of me. So when it bounced three yards to the right of me, everybody came out their lanes. So on punt return, as you know, when you come down, you post. Everybody's supposed to stay in their lane. So me fumbling made them go get out of their lane. So by the time I pick up the ball. I take like one step and I stick my foot in the ground and just run like a bat out of the word I don't want to say. And I just stick you my feet say in the ground. It's all good. Bat out a of hell, bro. Bat out of hell. <laughs> so I just stuck my foot in the ground, bat out of hell. And I seen one guy. It was actually the uh, long snapper. And Jason Avant was right there. I kind of set it up and went right around him. Jason Avant depleted him. Boom. See, nowadays, that would have been called back because he literally, Correct. like, it was a crack. It was a crack back on him. You know, they took that out of, the, out of yep. the game now. So he cracked back him. And then from there, I'm just running. And then there was, like, two, three seconds left on the, on the game clock. And they was like, oh, my God, what is this dude about to do now? Is he going to drop the ball before he get in the end zone? Because I, like, ran across the, uh, the goal line Smart. for a little Run bit. Run the timeout. <laughs> Run, Run the, the timeout. timeout. Only thing I, I regret is throwing that ball in the end zone. I wish I would have kept that ball. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, hey, it was, it was it was like I had wings, man. It was like my dad really, like, just, like, I'm going to take you and I'm going to put you on these wings and you're going to get in this end zone, man. But that, that, that hands down, is one of the best plays of my career. Man, I, I, got, I got a few more moments, but I think that one was – that that was special, man. That was right around that time where, you know, my pops was still heavily on me. And still to this day, he still is. But it was just – that's all I could really think about was my pops, man. All the hard work, everything that he meant to me, that that was huge, man. That was that was a classic. Well, you know, you were a walking big play in your career. You know, one year you led the league in punt return average four times uh, in your career. You led the NFL in yards per reception. What does that mean to you? Like, if if someone says besides the the play that we just talked about, define Deshaun Jackson's career. To me, the first thing I say is, well, it's four times. You know, nobody averaged more yards per catch than you. Mm-hmm. I, I think for me, man, sitting back and really, you know, implementing, like, my career, 
I, I don't think I already got the credit I deserve. And and the reason why I say that is because, you know, I, I really feel like I was a wide receiver run, a, a wide receiver one, being a, a smaller frame receiver, being a, a receiver that played punt return, that, that started wide receiver, that didn't really take plays off. I mean, didn't really get hurt too much out of my career besides kind of towards like the end of my career. But, you know, never really had no, no, no big time injuries, but it's just like, for some reason, I don't really get the credit I deserve. And it's like, you know, there wasn't a route I couldn't run. You know what I'm saying? I, I did across the field. I ran slants. I ran curls. Like, I was actually a real great route runner. Like, I don't think people really give me the credit for being a route runner. Like, I'm a speed guy. Speed guys usually are not known to run routes. I ran every right. route. Like, if you talk to some of my best coaches, Andy Reid, Sean McVay, Jay Gruden, um, you know, the list goes on, but I actually ran routes. And it's like, yeah, I'm a deep threat. Yeah, I can take the top off at any given time, but respect me for the intermediate routes. Respect me for catching the ball, a screen, and taking it 80 yards, which I've done before. Show me catching the ball and getting hit and still getting up and going back the next play. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's just, it is what it is. But at the end of the day, I know the body of work I put in. I know what I did, you know, 10,000 plus yards. Um, yep. You know, and the work is in the pudding, man. You know, so at the end of the day, when it's all said and done, if I don't play another down on the football field, man, you know, ho hopefully I'll, I'll be in that argument for Hall of Fame, man. If not, you know, I, I feel great coming from Los Angeles, California, and being, and being able to say I'm one of the best to come out of Los Angeles, California. One of the other funny things in your career was sort of a, 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 you were a byproduct of when – Ryan Fitzpatrick went in that heater with the Bucks. He showed up at that press conference with, with sure. a lot of your attire. With my gear. That chest, that chest hair everywhere, and he's got your, <laughs> your chains. Did you know he was going to do that? Man, honestly, I didn't know. Uh, so we come in that game, man, and, you know, every time I played the Eagles, because I, I took it serious, you know, because for them cutting me in 2013. So every time I got a chance to play versus the Eagles, man, it was something personal that I had against them. So, uh First yeah. game of the year, man. That was the, the year after they won the Super Bowl, too. It's something about me always beating up on the team that won the Super Bowl. Last year when I was playing for the Rams, the Bucks came in, I think, week three, and I kind of tortured them, too, after they won the Super Bowl. But, uh, yeah, no, nah, I didn't know, man. I just – first game of the year, I got fly, had my little nice little sweatsuit on with the glasses, my chain, and we killed, we killed the Eagles, man. After they won the Super Bowl, we got Nick Foles coming to town and the Eagles and Doug Peterson. And I just, see, yeah, I'm about to kill the Eagles. I'm ready. Every time I get a go against them, I'm ready to smash them. And we beat them pretty good. And, um, man, I don't know. He came to my locker. He's about to go to the press conference. And he came to my locker. He's like, man, let me wear that. I'm like, go ahead. Shit, he, <laughs> he, took, he took my big old jewelry, took my glasses, and he took the jacket. And he went in there. And I go in there, man, just sitting there. I'm looking. And I'm like, man, I, I, I'm trying to go home, man. Like, I need my stuff. He like, he told the reporters, I got one or two more questions. Deshaun needs his stuff. <laughs> but not nah, Fitzpatrick, man. No, that's not his name. Fitch Magic. Fitch Magic right. was one of yeah. a kind, man. He, he he was a hell of a quarterback, man. I, me and me and Fitch Patrick had a, a Fitch Ma Fitch Magic. We had a we we had a good tandem going on there for a few, for a few years, man. Oh yeah, we've had him on the podcast. We love Ryan, and we'll see what he does uh, working with Amazon. Um, and you mentioned going to the Rams, and I thought that was a really interesting signing because I thought it was going to be a really good fit, and you obviously had to be loving going back to California. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned the, the game against the Bucks, but then it didn't work out. Were you surprised that it went the way it did? Yeah, man, it, 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 it kind of hurt me, man, honestly. Uh, and the reason why is because, you know, I, I feel like I have a great relationship with, uh, with Sean McVay. Uh, you know, I, I feel like... You know, I kind of helped with his status as far as, you know, what we did in in, in Washington together. You know, he, sure. was the offensive, he was the offensive coordinator, me, Pierre Gorsan, uh, Jamison Crowder. You know, we, we that three years we had in, in, in Washington together, we we had a we had a good tandem there, man. And it was like I, I felt like, you know, what he implemented as a as an offensive coordinator to being able to transition into a head coach. I feel like I had. I can't say I take the, all the credit. I would never say I'm taking credit for somebody, but I feel like I helped, you know, with this status of being able to be looked at as a head coach because he was he was honestly like our head coach because he was the one like right. Jay Gruden was actually our head coach, but Sean McVay was actually the one that was in the meetings, orchestrating the plays, the game plan. 
taking nothing away from Jay, Jay Gruden because Jay Gruden was a heck of a coach and he did his thing too. But Sean McVay was the young, energized, enthusiastic coach where he was like, every Monday he got up there, this the game plan, this is what we're doing. Uh, Kirk Cousins, this is what I want you to look for. You get what I'm saying? Like he implemented that real swagger in our offense. So fast forward and when he got the head coaching job in L.A., uh, Joe Siegel was my agent at the time. And that, uh, what's the what's the Rams owner's name? What's their names? Stan Kroenke. Stan the Kroenke. Kron the Kroenkes. They actually called Joe Siegel to see me. They called two players. And I'm going I'm to see if you know who the second player. I was one of the players. The second player, who's, who's the one of the best left tackles in the game right now? Uh, well, was it Andrew Whitworth? No. Trent Williams. Oh, Trent Williams. Yeah, absolutely. They called me and Trent Williams, and they called they called us and said, man, what do you think about Sean McVay? And, you know, I, I, I told him the truth. I said, man, Sean McVay is going to be a hell of a coach in this league. He could take on the team. He could sit there, and he could get the attention. It's, it's something about a coach when they know how to relate to their players. You know, because you have some coaches that just talk down on players, and you have to do this, and you have to. It, he was more of understanding, like, I know what my players need, and I'm going to service them the best of my ability to make sure they're fresh. They understand the game plan. They know how to move quick when we need to do what we need to do. And it was just like I seen that at an early age with Sean McVay. So I said, it's something about McVay that's going to be a hell of a coach. And he actually got the job. So fast forward and back to this past offseason or last past offseason, they lost uh, Cooks. Brandon Cooks. Oh, yeah, Brandon Cooks. Yeah, Brandon they, Cooks. Yeah. They lost Brandon Cooks, and they didn't have a deep threat. So now this where I come into play was like Sean McVay reached out to me. He said, I don't got the money. I don't know how we're going to make this happen. But if we can make this happen, I would love to get you here. So I just let him and my agent work it out. And, you know, I, I, I took a little bit less. But, you know, I came home, yeah. and I was happy about it because I'm saying the Rams, Cooper Cup, Robert Woods, that's when Matthew right. Stafford was on the way. I'm like, man, it's home. Like, why not come home? And, uh, you know, things just kind of didn't really work out, man. It was just more of I felt I had a role, and it was promised to me. And throughout the season, it kind of started coming out where, shit, Cooper Cup getting people. He beating people deep. Why do I need Deshaun Jackson yeah. with Cooper Cup beating people 80 yards down the field? So it's like it just became a, a time where he didn't really know the role for me. He was having a hard time yeah. finding a role for me. And it was like, for me, I could have sat back and not really played and just say, all right, when you need me, I'm going to play. But I got too much of a swagger that I still knew I could play at a high level. And it was just like, you know, I, I would feel better if I played in the Super Bowl instead of me sitting back and not playing in the Super Bowl and being saying, like, oh, I was on the team and I we won a Super Bowl, but I didn't play in the Super Bowl. You get what I'm saying? Like, that's, that's not yeah, really yeah, yeah. the type of guy I am. I would rather implement or play in the game and say, like, I was a factor in that game instead of just saying, oh, I was on the team and, yeah, we won a Super Bowl, but I didn't play. So that was kind of where it came to. It's like, well, okay, well, let's try to find a team that's going to fit you. And at this time, it's week eight. I didn't know they was going to win the Super Bowl. I mean, they was a hell of a team. They did their thing. But who knows right. who's going to win the Super Bowl at week eight? Nobody. <laughs> you feel me? So, I mean, it's no bad blood, man. It's just just things didn't really work out, man. It was like, you know, what, what, what I wanted to implement. And I wasn't even asking to play a lot. I, you know, give me a few plays here and there. You know, give me a few touches here and there. Like, I, I wasn't asking for nothing too crazy. It was just like more of it becoming a role. Then it was like I, I was almost the elephant in the room where I wasn't even being talked to no more. It was like at first it was like we game planning. We trying to do this and do that. Then it was like it kind of just died out. And I'm like, damn, what's, what, yeah. what did I do? But, you know, it, it is what it is. It's a business, man. You know how it go. Uh, absolutely. So, do you take any sort of comfort in the fact that you were part of the team that eventually won a Super Bowl? I mean, or you, sure. are you like, I can't believe I wasn't there when they won it all? It's bittersweet. And the reason why I say that is because yeah. I really, feel, like you said, I, I really feel like I was a, a part of that, that, that puzzle that, you know, you, you build a Super Bowl in, in, in April, you know, in OTAs. In training camp, yeah. uh, the, the first few weeks of the season, you know, you, you you don't win a Super Bowl week 10, week 12, week 15. No, that is not when you win a Super Bowl. So I felt like I was a part of the process. I, You know, I, I, I built the camaraderie. You know, I put the time in, put the effort in. I sweat, blood, tears. Like, you know, I, I was really a part of it. And I was rewarded with a Super Bowl. You know, I mean, with a, with a ring. You know what I'm saying? And that's yeah. just the respect that I felt Sean McVay had for me. You know, he he really has. That's a has class a, move, right? That that's a class move by the organization. Respect the man to the utmost, and you know, for me, like I said, it's really bitter bittersweet because as much as I got the ring, 
I don't really show it off as much as like, you know, me like, yeah, I played in the Super Bowl and I made a big impact. But at the end of the day, I got a ring and I'm from Los Angeles. And this is in my backyard, right where that stadium is, SoFi Stadium is where I grew up playing Pop Warner football last. So, you know, it, it, it definitely means something to me. But, I mean, at the end of the day, man, it's life, man. If things happen how they happen. I wouldn't, you know, if, if anything I could re, I could look back and redo, I would have probably just, instead of kind of like vocalizing my, my, my opinion, I, I would have probably just like not really said anything. And it's just like, if you play me, you play me. If not, right. so be it. But me being who I am, that's not me, so I I, I don't really feel right. bad about the decision I made. Cause even leaving and going to to the Raiders and still you know made some big plays and you know was a pivotal you you know receiver over there for them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that's what's happened. Why don't we take a break? Our second break here with Deshaun Jackson. When we come back, we'll talk about what's ahead and some things that he's got working on. Stay with us. We're coming right back on this episode of Half Forgotten History. If you're planning to bet week six of the NFL, we need to get you ready with everything you need to know with Trey's Trends here, presented by Caesar Sportsbook. Look, just like we all thought, the NFC East is the power division in football. Three of the teams in the division have won at least four games, including the only unbeaten team left in the NFL, the Philadelphia Eagles, at 5 0, as they welcome in the 4 1 Cowboys on Sunday night. This one is going to be massive. Look, the Eagles remain the prohibitive favorite to win the division at minus 320, but Dallas is currently second at plus 340, and they're trying to repeat as NFC East champs, something that hasn't happened since Andy Reid was the head coach of the Eagles. He did it four years in a row. No one has been able to do it since. For Sunday night's game, the Cowboys are listed as a five-point underdog, despite going 7-2 and two straight up and against the spread in the last nine games in this series. And quite frankly, Dallas has been really dominant in NFC East games recently, winning and covering eight straight games within the division. No other team has won and covered more consecutive games in their division since the Colts did it 11 straight times from the 2012 to the 2014 season. If you're ready to place your bet, you know what to do. Download the Caesar Sportsbook app today and find more of Trace Trends by following at Caesar Sports on social media. Time for the answer to our Mercedes-Benz trivia question. We said Deshaun Jackson is 36th all-time in receiving yards in NFL history, but how many of those 35 in front of him are like Deshaun Jackson under six feet tall? There are six of them. Derek Mason, Charlie Joyner, Antonio Brown, Steve Largent, Henry Ellard, and Steve Smith. And now back to more of our Half Forgotten History episode with Deshaun Jackson. Back with you on this episode of Half Forgotten History with Deshaun Jackson. As you know, this season we're brought to you by Mercedes-Benz Sprinter Vans, and they help you unlock your potential. And we still think, Deshaun, you have a lot of potential left in your body in the NFL. So what would it take? What kind of situation would it take for you to go back in the league again and unlock that potential? I think uh, <clears throat> it, it's going to take the right situation. And when I say the right situation, it's going to take a – a, a, a veteran quarterback, a, a quarterback that, you know, if it was a me implement to a team where I could come in midseason and kind of have help with the quarterback telling me, you know, making it easier for me to be able to play in the offense because obviously coming in midseason, it's going to be hard to really know the whole offense. So I will have to lean on either an offensive coordinator, head coach, or a veteran quarterback that could, like, say we got to set few plays for this guy. If it's some deep plays, it's some screens, some little short route intermediate, let's make this be this guy row. And if he could come in and spark up a deep thread or or older mentality from, you know, a, a perspective and helping out with the young guys and being a mentor and, you know, kind of being a guy that's known a lot about being a pro as far as being a wide receiver in the NFL, I, I, I think, you know, I... I have a lot of intangibles to help and give to a young team right now and to young players and to just be that veteran savvy guy to come in and be a spark as well, too. So it really has to be a whole package, a whole fit. I think the biggest thing is the quarterback and the head coach. Yeah, um, that those are pretty important pieces. No no question about it. And earlier on this episode, we talked a little bit about uh, the documentary about your you did with your brother, about your father passing away. Uh, from pancreatic cancer and uh, from what I understand we're going to be relaunching that and, and putting that out there again yeah man so uh yeah it's, we're, we're calling it go deep so go deep is uh is the name of it and we actually it's appropriate uh, 
Yeah, go deep. Hey, when you think of Deshaun Jackson, just go deep. But uh, yeah, man, it's just re re implementing everything that the, the principles that you know we live by. Five principles. You know the obstacles that you know I had to face. Uh, you know my my dad. You know uh, passing away um in 2009, and just really showing what I've been doing after football. You know what I'm saying? Because a lot of times people just know me for. Deshaun Jackson, a football player. They don't know about the right. community work. I'm going into the inner cities, to the, uh, Crenshaw areas. Um, they don't know I have a, a you know, a, a nonprofit organization for pancreatic cancer. Um, I, I've created my own Pop Warner football team, the Cal, the Cali Bears. Um, you know how influ influential I am in the community as far as real estate. You know, Section A homing. Uh, you know, going back into you know, helping out with these kids in high school, you know what I'm saying, mentoring these kids, because now they're getting money now, you know, they're getting these NIL deals, name, image, and likeliness, you know, so I'm just helping mentor these kids so they know you got to pay taxes, it's agent fees, yeah. you know, put that money up, you know what I'm saying, it's, it's a lot of things that I'm trying to conquer right now, and the documentary shows everything, every steps of life, um, showing me you know, hanging out with my kids, mentoring my kids now, you know, developing them to my son wanting to be in the, playing football now. He's playing tackle. I wanted him to play flag, but he was like, no, Pops, I want to play yeah. tackle. I'm like, oh, my God. So it's just really, man, that <laughs> the, the, the life that I live off the football field is the biggest thing. But it shows every step of the way the hard work I put in. People don't understand the hard work I put in. People don't understand the the, the obstacles I had to face living in Crenshaw. Growing up, not knowing where the next meal was going to come come from, not knowing, you know, kids walking outside and just getting shot at and, and getting killed and losing their life. Like, you know, I'm really trying to help, you know, pull people out of these areas because they stuck in these areas. You know what I'm saying? And it's just a big horizon of, yeah. you know, the real me. I have a big heart and I want to help everybody. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, stay tuned for Go Deep, man. We're, we're, we're going to be repackaging it up and putting it out pretty soon, man. It's going to be a it's going to be a killer stellar documentary, man. Stay tuned. Well, we'll look forward to that, man. And I'll look forward to someone giving you a call with the right coach and the right quarterback and say, we might need a lid lifter down the stretch of the season. I got we'll I, I, I got, it, I got a hint. We talked about him earlier. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Hey, man, listen, I always enjoyed watching you play. I, I always appreciated the way you handle things, you know, whether they were good or bad. You were very upfront with them all the times. And as someone in this business, uh, I, that's all anyone can ask for. So respect. And uh, sure. I appreciate your time today. And we'll see what happens going forward, okay? Thanks, Trey, man. Keep doing your thing, bro. Take care. Appreciate you. So thanks again to Deshaun Jackson. We'll see. It certainly sounds like he's leaving the window open to come back and play in the NFL if the right opportunity presents itself. But when we come back next week, a very special guest again. This guy was the definitive figure of a defensive front for the Carolina Panthers. He burst onto the scene with incredible credentials. I'm talking about, of course, inside linebacker Luke Keekley. We'll talk to Luke about his journey from player to broadcaster, coming up next week on Half Forgotten History. We'll see you then.